this party started. In progress. All right, so I just want to put the syllabus back up here and remind us all that we have these homeworks due by Sunday. Also, there's the, um, you know, homework zero. I never seem to get that one on the syllabus. And if you guys could participate in the week one discussion as well. And um, that's the only real discussion we have in Canvas this semester. Okay. Um, any questions from last time? Oh, Anything at all? Feel free to shout out. Uh, are we talking about like the problems? Yeah. Okay, I have a question. Um, halfway through chapter 2.1, um, I was, there's like a question where you have to find the secant and I, um, I don't really remember how, I mean, I know how to do it like with the unit circle and to find it, you know, with Y and X, but is that what they're asking? Cause I'm, I keep putting in the answer and then it's wrong. So. Like um, to, what, what is the question asking you to says, find it? Use the point, um, the point lies on a curve and then it gives you the equation for the line. And then it says, uh, find the slope of the secant line. Um, so we find it for each X. And I think that mm -hmm. was when I were using the tables. And, um, and so I was trying to make the tables in my um, calculator. But I just kind of, I don't know. I got kind of stuck on that. So I wasn't understanding the concept of like what it was asking me to do. Okay, so yeah. Revisiting the problem, like the slope. So. Yeah, some of them give you um, a table to work from. And so those are already like here, giving you the X's and Y's. Right. That one just wasn't. It's a uh, question uh, four, I think. Oh, okay, yeah. So here you would want to use um, a table. So, okay. so you have a P, and then you have a Q, and so to find the slopes of the tangent lines, right? You want to use um a formula right and that's in the your line equation right um really you just want a formula for the slope just for the slope and so you know let your y be the slope which is going to be the y's, the right. 3 over 8 minus x. Yeah. Minus negative 3, so that's plus 3, right? Minus negative 3. Right. That's plus 3. Oh, and then, that's maybe what I and then over the x's, x minus 9. And that is a minus there. So this is your function for the slope. Oh. Um, I think I had a different um, point because I had point three, negative three. And then I was getting your answer says that, but my answer was 3.330000 because you needed six, whatever, decimal places. Maybe it just, maybe I was doing it right. I just didn't get all the numbers in. Okay. So yeah, if you want me to look at yours later, I can do that. But as long okay. as you have the idea, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, because everything you're doing right now is sort of what I was doing already. Like just doing the different okay. formula and then, you know, making it. Yeah. So, okay. Never mind. Thank you though for going over it. <laughs> okay. 
All right. Um, just letting people in. Okay, so I also wanna just remind us all that last time, right, we were looking at this problem. I'm gonna to try to keep talking into this mic. Right, so we had this parabola, y equals x squared. And we had a point P at one, one, right? And we were trying to find the equation of the tangent line at that point. You guys remember doing this problem? Trying to find the equation of that orange line, the tangent line. And so we already have one point on the orange line. We really needed another point, two points to find a line. Um, you know, also if we have the slope of the tangent line and the point on the tangent line, then we can come up with the equation of the tangent line using point slope form, right? point slope form like we did before. And so this idea of, hey, put another point on the function Q and move that Q as close to P as possible so that the slope of the secant line between P and Q is getting closer and closer to the slope of that tangent line, then we can find the slope of the tangent line. We have a point on the tangent line. And then we can use the point slope form to get that equation. Okay, so I'm trying to kind of remind you guys of this. And also I found a pretty cool, um, I think I see one of your kitty cats, Angelica. Mm -hmm. I'm such a big animal lover. I, this is me when I'm driving too. I'm like literally every dog I see, I have to stop and like, not literally stop my car, but if I'm talking, I'm like, look at the dog, look at the dog. Like, you know, no one's ever seen a dog before, but I, I'm so like that. And um. Yeah, I'm pretty much like that with any animal, but you know, it's normally the dogs that we see walking around, right? All right, so I found a, a kind of better Desmos um, applet here. And so notice I've got the function, it's the squared function. So that's kind of in purple, right? I've got the parabola. And then I've got this point. So this is the, my point P right here at one, one. And I'm really trying to find the slope of the tangent line, which is this blue line. And so, you know, forgive me, but it, you know, I couldn't get it to be exactly two. We saw that it was two. But that's, that's pretty close. I, I kept trying to slide that. I'm afraid I'm going to make it worse. But again, we know that the slope of this line, we've already seen it because we've worked it out. The slope of this tangent line is two. Now, this is our point Q up here. With general coordinates, just X and F of X, f of x is x squared. Okay, and right now, because of the beauty of, you know, computers, the slope of the secant line in green, we see it's about three and a half, right? That's the green secant line. Notice the slope of the green line, it's steeper than the slope of the blue line which is the tangent line. Now notice what happens as I drag Q closer and closer 
2p, right? It was three, like three and a half up here. And notice here, it's giving you the slope. It's about three and a half, it's pretty steep. As I'm moving Q closer to P, notice like here, it's about three. It's not as steep. If I get closer and closer to P, look at how the slope is getting closer to two, which is what we found was the slope of the tangent line. Look, when it's super, super close, Right? You pretty much like have the tangent line when it's, you know, right on top of it. And you could go the opposite from the opposite direction also and look at the slope as I get closer and closer. I'm getting closer to P. Right? The slope is just about one. 1.3, 1.4. So as my Q gets closer to P from both sides, the slope of that secant line is getting closer and closer to the slope of the tangent line. And we say that we're taking the limit of those slopes. And so that's what we were doing before when we saw Okay. And moving Q closer to P means your X coordinate is going to be closer and closer to one. Right? So we saw if X was, you know, getting closer and closer to one from the right, the slope gets closer to two. And as that X coordinate for the point Q, gets closer to one from the left. The slope of the secant line is approaching two from the left. Okay, so notice now how much time I'm spending talking about this idea about getting you know, closer and closer and taking a limit. It limits right at two. As Q goes to P, X is getting closer and closer to one. It appears that the slope of that secant line PQ is going to two. So, um, emphasis on just the importance of understanding this because we're we're talking about limits in this chapter. Okay, so we're still in 2.1, my little habit. Section 2.1 continued. Um, there's a velocity application. And velocity, it's that same idea as speed, right? So you're driving in your car or you're snowboarding. How fast are you going? Speed, though, is a number. It's a number, you know, with units, like feet per second or miles per hour or whatever. But velocity is a vector. It has that number and it also has a direction. Okay, so there's always a direction associated. So it could be positive or negative, right? Because we never say I'm going negative 20 miles per hour. Right, we actually say I'm going 20 miles per hour in reverse, right? But the speed is 20 on your uh, speedometer. Anyways, um, the average velocity, 
is defined as the change in position. Are you guys hearing me better today? Okay. Change in position over change in time. The change in time is also known as elapsed time, right? Like how much time has elapsed. Um, little notation. Sometimes people put AVE as a little subscript or AVG. Either way, um, you could also define that using the delta symbol, right? Change in position over change in time, where T is time. And so as a little example, if you um, drive a hundred miles in two hours, say down to, you're driving down to San Diego, it's roughly a hundred miles, right? It takes you about two hours if there's no traffic, right? In your average velocity, it's, you know, that change in the position, the 100 miles divided by the elapsed time. So that's 50 miles per hour. Or we can write it like that. So that's your average speed going down there. That's your average velocity driving down to San Diego. But as we all know, <laughs> if we've ever done that before, you're not literally on cruise control at 50, going constantly 50 miles per hour. Oh no, my friends. Sometimes you're probably going 65. Other times you're probably stuck bumper to bumper going zero or maybe rolling along at 10 miles per hour. So this is, it's just an average. Um, but what about your velocity at a particular time? So at a particular moment or instant, that's called the instantaneous velocity. That's what you're getting when you look at your speedometer. It's literally at that moment you're looking, it's giving you your instantaneous velocity. That instantaneous velocity is the limit of average velocities, as we're gonna see. So here's an example. The ball is thrown into the air. Uh, can I scroll up to the definition? Which definition did you want, Denise? And by the way, this is all in those lecture notes if you want to download them as well. Is that good?
Yeah, I got it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. A ball is thrown into the air with an initial velocity Um, and sometimes we put a little not, not for initial at 48 feet per second. Um, it's height in feet. Two seconds later. is given by this formula. Or equation. So now your question is to find a formula for the average velocity. for a time period beginning at t equals two and lasting eight seconds. Okay, so again, I want to stop and just regroup and make sure we all understand what's going on. Okay. We have this height function as a function of time. Balls thrown into the air. We can find out the height based on how many seconds have elapsed, right? So when T is like three seconds, we can figure out the height of the ball. We're looking to find a formula for the average velocity. Okay, the average velocity. So when you throw a ball up, it's going to start with an initial velocity, but then gravity is going to be pulling it down. So the velocity is going to be changing over time. So we want to get the average velocity over a particular time period. Okay. Um, I also cleverly no humility in that at all. Um, graphed this function. <laughs> okay. So this is a function we already hopefully know, right? It's a parabola because the highest order is two and it's got the negative coefficient. So it opens downward. Um, so yeah, basically we're saying, you know, at, so th this, this axis here is T, right? So at T equals two, I want to get some formula for an average uh, velocity. An average velocity, it's the change in position over the change in time. Change in position over change in time. So in our case, the change in the position, I want to call this H, right? <laughs> right? It's our height function as a function of time. But whatever. Okay, I called it Y. I think it, that's because in WebAssign they call it Y. But you know, I tend to use a letter that reminds me what the heck we're talking about because I have such a bad memory. But so it's going to be the change in Y over the change in T, which is a slope of a line, right? It's a slope, in fact, of a secant line. So like here. When T is three, right? The change in Y over the change in T 
It's the slope of that secant line. Okay. So, and I wish there were a, a better way for me to switch screens. There might be, and I might, you know, get that down at some point. But, um, All right, so the average velocity, change in position, over the change in time, that's the change in y over the change in time. Now let's think about what, you know, I gave that random example, hey, what if t were three? But, you know, we're starting at two, okay? Just right. You know, one point. You know, one point is going to be a two, and whatever y of two is. Right? That was that point P I put up there on the graph, right? right here. And then what's our other second point going to be? It's way too big. I'm just trying to get this beginning in here. Two and one, two. That's our first point there. And now, you know, the time goes by eight seconds. So you want to think in terms of, you know, B plus eight. Does that make sense? Eight seconds goes by, so you, you're going to add eight to, and then you're going to do the Y of that two plus eight. Okay. Does that make sense? Everything we redo, we want it to make sense. Let me just make sure no one's trying to get in. Okay. Okay, so we've got y of two plus h minus y of two, right? We're doing the change in y's over the change in t's. And then whatever, you know, point you end up at is going to be 2 plus h, right? So you've got 2 plus h minus 2. So that's y of 2 plus h minus y of 2. Notice on the bottom, the 2's cancel and you just have an h down there. Okay, so we're going to put the 2 plus h in for t in that y formula, right? y of 2 plus h, you substitute it in there for y, that for t. <laughs> I had one job. We have 48 times 2 plus h minus 16 times. 2 plus h quantity squared. Okay, I like to bracket that in. That's the y of 2 plus h. And then minus y of 2. So now you're going to substitute the 2 in. 8 times 2 minus 16 times 2 squared. And all of that is your y of 2. All of that.
Okay, so then we just want to simplify this. So we work inside the brackets and multiply out those parentheses and all of that. So 48 times 2, we get 96 plus 48H minus, and you have to foil 2 plus H quantity squared and then multiply it by negative 16. Okay. When you foil that, you end up with 4 plus 4H plus H squared and then multiply that by the 16. And then you have two times 48 is 96, minus four times 16 is 64. I have a question uh, on the second part of the problem. It's the X, that's why there's no H, right? Because you're doing the distance formula. I'm just trying to acclimate. Like, why am I using H, do you mean? No, um, on the second part of after the minus sign, you're doing X, right? So you're doing times for the T, the T of the graph. And that's why there's no H. Are you doing the distance formula right now? No. Okay, then I don't I'm, understand why the first half of this problem has an H and the second part doesn't. What, what like do you mean the, the second part doesn't? The first term has H and the second term doesn't have H. No, like over here. Okay, so <laughs> this part, Y of 2 plus H? Yeah. That means you're going to literally put Q plus H in for T. Does that make sense? And you're literally substituting in Q plus H for the T here. And then the second term here, I don't know how it in purple or fuchsia. Okay, <laughs> is the time because it's X, right? There's no X, but it's a T. Right. It's a T. Why is T? Okay, that's what I was asking. I'm just making sure I'm on board with what's the yeah, happening. Totally. totally. Okay. All right, so we've got 96 plus 48H minus 64 minus 64H minus 16H squared minus 96 plus 64. And then you can start canceling stuff. So 64 is cancel, 96 is cancel. Okay. So I've got um, minus. Minus 16H squared and then minus 16H over H. And then I can factor out the H on the top.
and cancel that H on the bottom. Okay, so this is a formula for, oops, that went on, for the average velocity. Just going back to like what we're doing, find a formula for the average velocity. So there's a formula for the average velocity. Please scroll up just a little bit. Yeah. I knew that was a bad idea. I did it. <laughs> I had a question with the 48H also be fast. And now I just combine you know, those two to get the amount of H. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> Find right. the average for, like, suppose one and a half seconds transpired. Don't like, don't like. <laughs> and how about if a half a second elapsed? How about if a tenth of a second elapsed? Okay, now that you have that formula, literally all you have to do is plug in H. So you get negative 16 times 1.5 minus 16. And that's negative 40 feet per second. And so, you know, again, and coming back to this graph, you know, after a second and a half, you can imagine that slope is pretty steep and it's negative. That's the average velocity between the two and after a second and a half, it'll be three and a half. And this is neg negative 24 feet per second. After a tenth of a second, so that's um, negative 1.6 minus 16 is minus 17.6. Can you scroll down a little bit, please? So notice I'm letting the elapsed time get smaller and smaller and smaller. Right, what's the average velocity after only uh, 10 Ten thousandth of a second. Okay. 
and it's a negative set 16.0016 feet per second. So what do you think the instantaneous velocity is? Two. I mean, the average velocity seems to be getting closer and closer to 16, right? So as H goes to zero, that's that elapsed time. As that goes to zero, I'm just going to bring up the graph. As h goes to zero, right, the two points are getting closer and closer and closer. So the average velocity, which is, um, negative 16h minus 16 you know when h goes to zero this part literally goes to zero even algebraically we can see as you substitute numbers in for h that get smaller and smaller as it goes to zero eventually that whole term goes to zero and so that average velocity comes to 16 feet per second, which is the instantaneous velocity after two seconds. And if that formula looked familiar to you, you might recognize it. It is the difference quotient. So back in pre-calculus, right, they have you playing around with this equation, the difference quotient, and this is why. If we're using some function like a point A, plus from the last time, and then minus infinite a over that elapsed time. I'm using that, you know, um, example. Example. Okay, so this is like the big, I, the big ideas in two point one. That velocity application and. Just that idea of a limit. We are not going to be making tables like all semester and everything. You know, that's really to give you the idea and to literally show how, you know, if you keep moving the points closer and closer, the slopes approaching a value. I'm coming back over here now. All right, so 2.2, that was the end of section 2.1, okay? Section 2.2 has a, a lot of words <laughs> and it's really not, um, going to be very effective for us to just be copying a bunch of words. This is the PowerPoint that's also uploaded in, you know, our Canvas. Okay. So 2.2. If, oh, look at the kitty. <laughs> if anybody, oh, he's a good boy. <laughs> I love him. <laughs> Every time it's going to get me, it's terrible. 
I always think, you know, my husband's British, right? So whenever, oh, look at the tail. Whenever we're in England, there's sheep everywhere. And, you know, the whole time we're driving, I'm just, look at the sheep, look at the sheep. They're everywhere too. So it gets annoying, I'm sure. But they're so cute with the black faces. I just love them. Anyway, yeah, 2.2 .2 is on the limit of a function. <laughs> All right, so to find the tangent to a curve. So again, this is going to be like we're focusing on understanding what's going on here, okay? Um, to find the tangent to a curve or the velocity of an object, we turn our attention to limits in general and numerical and graphical methods for computing them, okay? So let's investigate the behavior of the function f for values of x near two. Okay. So here we're literally just looking at those y values of the function or x values that are getting closer and closer to two. So, you know, we could do this on a calculator and enter the function and then you know, enter these values for X, and these are the Y values. Close to X equals two. So notice we're coming from the left, you know, one, one and a half, 1.99999. 1 and then we're also coming from the right, three, two and a half, 2.1, 2.0001, 1. okay? So we're looking at the Y values as we're getting closer and closer to x equals two. A picture is always worth a thousand words, okay? Here's the parabola, the graph of that function. And see down here, we're getting closer and closer to two on both sides. And we're noticing that the function value as those X's, if you were gonna input like 1.999 in the function, the Y value is getting closer and closer to four in both directions. So are you guys with me on this? Feel free to give a reaction. Cause really this is, this, what we're talking about right now, this underpins every single thing we're gonna do in calculus, okay? So if you're sitting there right now, like, I don't know what she's talking about, but I'm gonna wait till we do a problem so I can mimic how to do the problem. Like, that's not a good approach. I'm just saying, okay? And, you know, obviously the first time you see it, it's not gonna be as crystal clear as once you work with it a lot. But I just want you guys to try to stay with me, okay? I want you to keep trying and asking questions, literally as if I'm giving you directions to my house right now. If you don't understand it, you're not gonna make it to my house for the party, right? You have to ask your question. If I say, oh yeah, you go to the freeway and you turn left, you're gonna have to know coming from which direction or I'm not gonna know if I'm going north or south, right? You have to ask the question to get there. Do you know what I'm saying? So I want you to understand what's going on. We're looking at X values that are getting closer and closer to two. And we're noticing the Y values are getting closer and closer to four as we're inputting X values that are closer and closer to two. Look, 1.99, it's 3.9701, blah, blah, blah. That's close to four, right? And graphically, we can see, you know, if I, if I put in an X value of about like 1.9, you know, that's going to be about right here. And so my Y value, it's going to be about um, maybe 3.9, whatever, right? <laughs> you see what I'm saying though, right? 
And the same from the right hand side. If you do like 2.1, you're going to go up here. And the y value, it's just going to be a little more than four. But as you get closer and closer to two, and notice what happens when you substitute two in there. Two squared is four, minus two is two, plus two gives you four, right? And we can see it here on the graph. So that is the point, two, four. When x is two, y is four. And we don't care so much about that actual point in calculus. We're really looking at what is the number approaching? It's approaching. As X approaches two, Y approaches four. Okay. So in fact, it appears that we can make the values of those Ys as close to four as we want by getting as close, you know, by getting closer to two. Okay. So think about quality control. You're an engineer, you're a computer scientist, you're making some part and it needs to be like four millimeters. Okay. But quality control you want, it needs to be, you know, it can't be five. It's not going to work. It can't be three. It can't be too small. It can't be too big. It's not going to be perfect, but maybe you want it to be plus or minus 0 0.01 millimeters. You see what I'm saying? You want it close to four within a certain like tolerance. Well, hey, if you want it to be plus or minus 0.01, we can figure out how close to two we need the tool to make it. Okay, literally, this is the power of calculus, you guys. I just got chills. I've been doing this for years, and it's still, it's amazing. Okay, so we can get whatever kind of tolerance we want, because by getting like the part as, you know, close to two as we want. So here's the notation and all. So we say the limit of the function as x approaches two is four. Because those numbers, you know, the y numbers were getting closer and closer to four. That's the limit. Okay, so notice the notation here. The limit as x Formally, it's approaches. Most people say goes to, and you know, just like in real life, you don't approach the store, you go to the store, right? So the limit as X goes to two of this function is four, okay? So I'll be saying goes to probably most of the time, unless I'm really trying to emphasize that approach all right, so here's the intuitive definition of a limit. And then in section 2.4, I believe it is, we look at the precise definition. But for right now, because again, the understanding is so, so important. So please don't give up if you have questions. Ask, you know, go to the Mass Success Center, meet with me, whatever, okay? The intuitive definition. Suppose some function f of x is defined when x is near the number a. So like in the last example, when x was near two. So this means that f is defined on some open interval that contains a. We don't care about a itself. Like in the last problem, we didn't really care about the number two itself. We're really just looking at approaching a value and approaching the value. We don't care about whether or not the function is defined at two or at a in general. So if that is true, then we write the limit as x goes to a of f of x equals L. That's the limit, we call it capital L. So we say the limit of f of x 
is x goes to a of equals l. Okay. We can make the values of f of x arbitrarily close to l. That means as close to l as we want. Again, like we're trying to make a part as close, you know, we want to make it as close as we want to four. Let's say we want it to be within one one hundredth of a millimeter or whatever. So as long as we can get as close as we want by restricting X to be sufficiently close to A on both sides really, but not equal to A, then that's what it means to be a limit, okay? It means that <laughs> um, the function equals that value when you get closer and closer and closer to you know, A. As X gets close to A, Y gets close to L. Is the limit as close as you could get before it turns into the number? Is that what we're searching for? No, or is it it's a very different right? idea. Okay. There's, there's the function value and then there's a limit. So the limit is just kind of like, it's approaching, you know. And the limit could know. be anywhere from whatever range. It doesn't have to be, you know, precise, I guess you're saying. It is actually gonna be precise. It's gonna okay. be precise. But, um, and I mean, the best example of, you know, so like, is hey, what if- Precision right before you get to the point or what's the precision? It literally is that number because so you can you can get yeah it is that number because you know it's it's like with that last example you can get as close as you want yeah. so it just depends on like what part you're making like how big how much tolerance it can have or it depends yeah, on like if, the if, circumstances. If you can make the smallest tolerance that you want, okay, if that's in the realm of possibility to have the smallest tolerance that you want right. and you'll be able to find a tool for that, then that's the limit. So it's okay, so like four the is tool. the limit. Because I'm saying you can get as close as you want. Four is the limit because you can get as close as you want to four. That's weird, I know. It's circumstantial, the limit. I mean, it's it's a concept. Yeah. It's a concept. Okay. Okay. So, you know, if you look at like this graph right here, Right, the blue thing is the function. And notice as you approach A from the left and you approach A from the right, the function values are approaching L. I can get as close to L as I want by choosing an X value close to A. But notice there's a hole in that graph at A. So F of A is not L, right? F of A is whatever's down here. I mean, I'm just gonna make some, the heck of it. like let's just say that's three, right? So F at A is three, and yet the limit as X goes to A is L. So maybe L is four, just as an example, okay? So see how the limit now has a whole different idea. We're not talking about just the Y value for A, we're talking about the limit of the function as X approaches A. And as long as you can get as close to that number as you want, then that is called the limit.
is the limit always like on the x line or do we do limit for y too the limit is always the y value actually oh, oh yeah always Okay, so yeah, so this says that the values of you know F approach L is X approaches A. In other words, the values of F tend to get closer and closer to the number L as X gets closer and closer to the number A from either side. And we don't even care about you know, X equaling A. Um, other notation, the limit as X goes to A of F, F equals L. You could also just write F goes to L as X goes to A. I mean, the top is more, you know, look, it's, it's nice and compact. You've got everything in one equation kind of thing. You know, sometimes you're just talking about one piece or the other, whatever. But anyways, um, and then notice down here in the bottom, notice the phrase, but X doesn't equals A. This means that when you find the limit as X approaches A, we never consider X equals A. You don't consider it at all. This is all about approaching, okay? It's always just about approaching. So in other words, you know, again, if you're creating some thing, it's it's kind of like you already accept that there's no perfection or whatever, you know? Um, yeah, we never even look at that. We're just talking about approaching. So when we write our answer to this, we always put LIM? Like yes. the limit is, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so back to this slide, right? We have three functions here. So, you know, in all three of these cases, the limit as X approaches A of the blue function equals L. So here, I mean, it's pretty clear. This is like the type of function we were looking at before. As you get closer and closer to A on the left and the right, from the left and the right, you go to L. Same here, even though F of A is, you know, a separate value, here F of A is not even defined. Nonetheless, the limit is defined, okay? So it's really like, what is the limit? Sometimes I think about like of a machine. What is the limit? Even if it never hits that, you know? It's like, what is the value that it's approaching? What is the value it's approaching? Okay. <laughs> Let's take a break here. Yeah, it's 10.04. Let's take a break. And, um, and we'll come back at 10.15, okay? Okay, welcome back, y'all. All right. So here's an example of a function. <clears throat> Notice, well, so here's a function and we're being asked to guess the value um, of the limit as x goes to one of that function, right? So notice this function is not defined when x equals one. <clears throat> but it, you know, it doesn't matter that the function isn't defined at one. We can still find the limit as x goes to one. So look here again, I'm just saying we're using tables to just 
show what happens literally precisely when you're choosing X values close to one from the left and the right. Again, this is not like some method we're always going to use going forward. And I say that because I've had students like on an exam, you know, find a limit by making all kinds of tables and stuff. And really, you know, this is just to help develop our understanding of what a limit means. So as it says here, on the basis of the values in the table, you could guess that the limit of that function as x goes to one is a half, because you see how the y values are approaching a half, right, 0.5. All right, here, um, the function is graphed. And, um, you know, the function is not defined at x equals one. So there's a hole there. And they're saying, let's change the function slightly. <clears throat> Make it a piecewise function, piecewise defined function, where if x is not one, you have that function. But if x is one, then let's say, you know, this new function g is two. So that's here, right? So the original function was not defined for x equals one, but now this new function g says, okay, when x is one, y is two. This new function g has the same exact limit as x approaches one, right? The limit is still a half, whether the function is defined at one or not. So that was the deal with that example. Questions, somebody asked me a question. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand uh, once it's at two, if we're, if x is two, is it because we're coming from the opposite way? So here again, okay, the, the limit is always the y value that the oh, right. function is approaching. Yeah. So it's getting closer and closer to 0.5 or a half. Oh, because we're still using this, uh, I don't know, function, I guess. Okay. Even if, you know, technically when X equals one, Y is two. You know, if you're getting close to one, you're getting closer to a half. Okay. And I mean, I'll have to look on the table. So let me just do. At 0.9, it's I roughly. Because we're always trying to figure out basically why for the limit, right? Okay. 0 0.476, approximately. I'm just writing three decimals because it's too much to write. Okay. So again, the limit is still a half. Okay. All right. Now there's the notion of one-sided limits, right? Because we keep talking about, oh, you can, you know, like the last problem, approach one from both sides. We can also talk about a limit from just one side, the left or the right. So we start off talking about this function h. And by the way, this is an actual common function. It's called the heavy side function, named after the person who developed it, Oliver Heaviside. Um, but anyways, so this is also a piecewise defined function. 
So if t is less than zero, it's zero. And if t is greater than or equal to zero, it's one. Okay. So h approaches zero as t approaches zero from the left. And it approaches one as t approaches zero from the right. Do they give you a graph on this one? They don't. Let me. Do a quick sketch. Uh, I have a question about that little mark under. Is that equal to, or is that a different? This is no, from on the, the left. On the top, oh. uh, on the formula, it says t is equal to, or greater than or equal to zero. Oh, OK. That's it, greater than or equal to. Yeah. Okay, I didn't know if there was like a new little sign for like limit, because it was slanted, so I just didn't know. Oh, no. no. So it's saying, you know, the function is zero when t is less than zero and it's one. Um, so here it's strictly less than and here. So again, now when you're talking about the limit, Right. What is the what's the limit as you go towards zero? Right. We're looking at the x's. If you're going towards zero from the left, so maybe you're choosing like negative two, negative one, right? Negative a half, blah, 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 blah. As you're approaching x from the left, the y value is zero, okay? Even though it's not defined at zero, we just want to know as t approaches zero from the left, okay? And then the limit as t approaches zero from the right, maybe I should use a different color. So again, maybe you're at two and at one and at a half, et cetera. Right, your y values are approaching one. In fact, they're one every single time. <laughs> okay. The notation t goes to zero with a minus, that means we're only looking at values of t that are less than zero. So it's t goes to, to zero from the left. And so that's less than zero. t goes to zero from the right. We have a little plus sign up there. So that means we're only considering values of t that are greater than zero. So I think the minus and the plus is intuitive. You know, you're coming from the left or you're coming from the right. I'm kind of like, thank goodness, because if it's too out there, it's hard to remember. All right, so definition of a one-sided limit. We write the limit as x goes to a from the left of f of x equals l. So we say the left-hand limit of f as x approaches a, or the limit of f as x approaches a from the left is equal to l if we can make the values of f as close to l as we want by taking x values sufficiently close to a, as long as the x now is less than a. And so as it says, notice that the only difference in this definition from the last one is that we're only looking at x values less than a. We're not looking from both sides. We're only looking at one side, okay? So we're saying that limit exists and we're going to call it L if it's true that you can get as close to L as you want by picking, you know, an X value less, to, less than A. I'm trying to say it a few different ways myself. All right, and similarly, if we, if we require X to be greater than A, then we get the right-hand limit. 
as X approaches A. And then that's with the plus. So the no notation means you only consider X greater than A. So this picture A and this graph over here B, notice that this first one, it's the limit as X approaches A from the left. Okay. So the pink up here is the function. And we're looking at X values that are getting closer and closer to A. And then the Y value is getting closer and closer to L. You know, another way of writing, you know, the L there is to say it has a height of L. So that's what that's signifying there. So see that height, it's getting closer and closer to that height. Right, the Y value is the height, right? The X value is this like kind of width. And then in graph B, again, the pink is the function. And as the X values, you know, maybe here that's at X equals five. And then we're going down to four and three and two, and we're getting closer and closer to A, maybe A is one. As that's getting closer, you know, the Y value is approaching L. I drew the arrow up here because you can see like here, it's more than L, it's more than L, it's more than L, right? When you get close, it's more than L, but eventually like, that's the limit, okay? So yeah, now we're just looking from one side. Um, comparing definition one with the definitions of the one-sided limits, we see that it's true that, you know, the limit as X goes to A of F equals L is true if and only if both of the one-sided limits are true. So you need the limit from the left and the limit from the right to be L or the limit in general to be L, okay? So when we don't specify from the left or the right, this means you have to have both from the left and the right. If and only if, right? That has the implication both ways, okay? So we know if a, so, in general. Sorry, I just want to make sure. So if it doesn't have a negative or a plus sign, it means both sides. Yep. Okay. And so you also know, right, if you're given this situation right here, that the limit is L, you know that the left hand side is L and the right hand side is L. Just saying. Okay. All right. Oops. Okay. So what is G here is the blue function. What's the limit of G as X goes to two from the left? You guys think? As you're getting closer and closer to two from the left, the Y values, Oh. Right, are getting closer and closer to three. Mm 
Is that good? And then what about as you're approaching to from the right, the Y values? Right. So you're looking on the X axis as you're the X's are approaching to from the right. You go up and you look at the Y values, right? It's getting closer and closer to one. Yeah. And then what is the limit as X goes to two? That means now from both sides. Here, the limit does not exist. I'm like, they didn't even mention that in a previous slide. But the limit does not exist because the limit from the left does not equal the limit from the right. So it, it does say if they exist. So it does not exist. Oftentimes we put D in E for does not exist. Have you guys heard that before or something? Can't remember what else. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Diego had it there in the, uh, in the chat. And then the limit as X goes to five from the left. So you're looking over here, you're getting closer and closer to five. So you're looking at those function values. Two? Getting closer and closer to two. And then what about from the right? The Y values, they're still getting closer and closer to two, right? Again, we don't care about at five. We're just looking at the approach. And so what's the limit as X goes to five? Two. It is two, right? I know it's tempting to say one, <laughs> but it's two. It's the limit coming from both sides. The Y value is approaching two. You want to know what is that value of the Y value approaching? That's a different question than what is G of five, right? Do that in a different color, even. So, just in general, G of five is one. Let's looks like it's a little more than one. Let's just say it's one. I can't tell. <laughs> right, whatever the y coordinate is there. Okay. Questions on this before we move along. So the limit questions will ignore the dots that are not part of the function line. You mean the, the points? I'm not sure I understand your question. We'll ignore. Sorry. Sorry, I'm probably not using the correct terms. But yeah, my question is like, so if it's asking the limit of x2 blah blah blah. Um, so if that solid dot that's on the that's off of the function line, we we'll just ignore that, correct? Unless it's asking what that actual point is. Yep, you're going to completely ignore that. Okay. And maybe there is, you know, like here, there is no other dot. So you're ignoring the fact that there is no dot. Here you're ignoring the fact that there is a dot. 
basically you're ignoring everything else in the universe. You're only looking at <laughs> be funny. Literally though, you're ignoring everything else. You're only looking at what is the Y value getting close to as X is, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> Try to have some levity once in a while. All right. All right, here, I think they're, they've just worked through those. Okay. There's also the notion of infinite limits. Here's the intuitive definition. So, so far, you know, we've taken the limit of a function and we've gotten a, a solid number. The, the Y values are approaching four or they're approaching two. But look, that function, the Y value could just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and, bigger and go to infinity. So here's the intuitive definition. Let F be a function defined on both sides of A, except possibly at A itself, because we just don't even care. Then the limit as X goes to A from both sides, as you're getting closer and closer to some X value from both sides, the Y value is getting ridiculously large. Okay. No worries, Angelica. <laughs> um, so it means that we can, you know, make those Y values as large as we want by getting as close to some value A as we need to. So you can also write it like this, kind of like before, the limit as X goes to A of F equals infinity, or you could say F goes to infinity as X goes to A. Okay. All right, so the symbol infinity is not a number. It, it really is a concept or an idea. Um, but we still, you know, notation-wise say it equals infinity, even though nothing can really equal infinity. It's more that it goes toward infinity but we can still write it like that. We can still say it is infinity. We can say that the function becomes infinite as X approaches A, or it increases without bound. That terminology shows up a lot more as you go on, increasing without bound, as you start talking about bounds. So here's an example, y is the blue function, and that's a. So as you're getting closer and closer to a from both the left and the right, if I were to make a table of values, you know, as a, I got closer to a from both the left and the right, those y values would be ridiculously large. And similarly, you could have the limit going to negative infinity. So now, as the x values are approaching a from both sides, the y values are getting really large and negative, we say. You could say really small, but sometimes we say really large and negative. Okay, so similar definition. Yeah, and they say large negative here too. So the limit as X goes to A of F is negative infinity means that the values of the function can be made as large as we want by taking X sufficiently close to A, but not equal to A.
All right, so the symbol, the limit as x goes to a of f can be read. The limit of f as x approaches a is negative infinity or it decreases without bound. And here's an example right here. The limit as x goes to zero of this expression is negative infinity. And, you know, you can just think of examples. As x goes to zero, you know, think about like if you have 10, you have negative one over 10 squared, that's negative over 100. And then if you have one, you get negative one. And if you have like a half, a half squared is a fourth. One divided by a fourth is four. So you can see these keep getting bigger, but negative. Like one tenth, one tenth squared is one one hundredth. When you divide by one one hundredth, that's the same as multiplying by one hundred. Just kind of, kind of ran out of room. Et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So you guys are going to want to know how to do these, you know, even if you're not literally making tables, like you want to be able to think through what is that limit? Like if, if the answer weren't put there, could you come up with the limit? And here I've, I've chosen, you know, positive values. So values to the right of zero, then you'd wanna do the same with values to the left of zero. And then we have similar definitions for one-sided infinite limits. So the limit as x goes to a from the left of a function is infinity or negative infinity. And the limit as x goes to a from the right is either positive or negative infinity. And here are some examples, right? Like here, as you're approaching a from the left, the function is going up to positive infinity. And here, as you're approaching a from the left, the function is going toward negative infinity. And over here, as you're approaching a from the right, function goes to positive infinity. And here, the function goes to negative infinity. Okay, this is actually a way to define these vertical asymptotes. You guys probably remember these from algebra and pre-calculus, you know, with rational functions. So the vertical line x equals a is called the vertical asymptote of a curve if at least one of these statements is true. So if you have a limit where the function goes to positive or negative infinity, you get a vertical asymptote. Whether it's, you know, a full limit from both sides or a one-sided limit. And this is a nice example. Um, yeah, okay. Oops. Find the vertical asymptotes of the tangent function. And yeah, on the next slide, it shows you the different branches of the tangent function, right? And these are those vertical asymptotes at the, you know, pi over two plus or minus pi. Okay, there's period of pi. So tangent is sine over cosine. 
And you might remember with rational expressions, you know, we end up with vertical asymptotes where the bottom equals zero. So there are potential vertical asymptotes where the cosine is zero. And since the cosine goes to zero from the right, as x goes to pi over two from the left, and it goes to zero from the left as x goes to pi over two from the right, whereas sine is positive near one, um, you end up with these limits. And as x goes to pi over two from the left, you get positive infinity. And as x goes to pi over two from the right, you get negative infinity. So that's just, you know, one particular example there. Okay, so this is 2.2, all about the, um, you know, intuitive limits of a function, okay? And last but not least, we'll talk about 2.3. Section 2.3 is on limit laws. There are laws for working with these limits. Kind of like, um, you know, we learn in algebra about exponents, and then there are all the exponent laws or rules. This is an example. So um, I've just copied from my lecture notes that are posted already. Because wordiness. <laughs> um, but I want to make sure you guys really understand these limit laws. Abbreviated LL, by the way. So suppose C is a constant and the limit, the limit is x goes to A of S. Professor, you're cutting out. It's going so well earlier. <laughs> I'm like, no, what happened? I need to find where exactly my mic is too. All right. Can you turn your head just a little too far to one side hey. and it decides that you don't exist? And that's ridiculous, by the way. This is why I have tech, you know, support. If you're using an iPad, you can maybe using like an air your AirPods or headphones would fix the problem. I know. You know, I thought this morning, why don't I use a headphone, which is such so uncomfortable. And I think I recently maybe even gave my headphones away. <laughs> but you're right. I think I do have the. Um, but aren't those just for listening, or is there a mic with? The... There's a there's a mic on AirPods. They're uh, exactly like your headphones, just wireless. I might even have them right here. No, I think I put them back downstairs. Okay, so I'll be looking into that for next week. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up. Um, yeah, so, so suppose C is a constant and the limit of F and the limit of G exists. And notice all of these laws also work for the left and right limits. So the first one is called the sum law. The limit of the sum equals the sum of the limits. So the limit as x goes to a of f plus g is the same as the limit of f plus the limit of g. That's the sum law. And then the difference law, right, which is obvious if the sum law is true. The limit of the difference is the difference of the limits. 
All right, the limit of f minus g, it's the same as the limit of g minus uh, the limit of f minus the limit of g. And then there's a constant multiple law, the limit of a constant times a function. You can pull the constant out of the limit. The constant times the limit. And then there's a product law. You know, again, these always remind me of like the exponent rules, you know. So the limit of a product, the limit of f times g is the product of those two limits. The limit of f times the limit of g. And the quotient rule or quotient law, the limit of a quotient is the quotient of the limits. The limit of the bottom is at zero because you can't divide by zero ever. And then there's a power law. So the limit of a function raised to a power is the same as raising the limit to the power. As long as that power is a positive integer. And then the limit of a constant is a constant, right? Because it's just constant. So no matter what x value you pick, you know, you know, the y's are not changing. It's constant. It doesn't depend on x. <laughs> and then the limit as x goes to a of x is just a. The limit as x goes to a of x to the n is a to the n. So it's kind of like you can just substitute right in. You can actually substitute. We're going to end up with the substitution property. Um, you can substitute in the a for the n. And there's that um, square root, the limit of uh, the nth root of x. As x goes to a, again, you can like substitute. We're going to be seeing these in action, by the way. So don't be too scared. <laughs> and then there's that root law. The limit of a root is a root of a limit of the limit. And again, that's for a positive root. And you know, assume that a is also positive. Okay, so those are all of the laws that we're going to be using. Um, and yes, next up is that direct substitution property. So if f is a polynomial or a rational function, You guys okay with my abbreviations? Poly for polynomial, FNC for function, and A is an element of the domain of F. Now, as I have in my notes, right, that symbol means is an element of. And the D sub F there, that means domain of F. Then the limit is X goes to A of F of X equals F of A. So you can literally directly substitute in.
So as an example, if you have this function, and then you wanted to find the limit as x goes to two of f, you can just substitute it right in, it's just f of two. And again, think about this, if you graphed that parabola, right, that function, and you're just looking, you know, as x equals two, the y, I, I shouldn't put the axis on it, but if we were there, it ends up giving you, see, three times two squared plus two minus one. That's 12, 14, 13. And of course, with the polynomial functions, these are nice, smooth, continuous functions, right? So you're not going to have a hole. You're not going to have a gap. You're not going to have an asymptote. We're going to see some other things. Um, but yeah, so it makes sense that you can just substitute in when you're finding a limit. When you have a polynomial or a rational function, as long as, you know, especially now I'm thinking of the rational function, as long as that A is in the domain of F, right? You don't want it to be where there's a asymptote. All right, so let's look at some other examples here. Suppose you're given the limit is x goes to three of f is nine. The limit is x goes to three of g is negative four. And the limit is x goes to three of h is zero. Okay, so using the limit laws, find, find the limit as x goes to three of f of x plus five g of x. Okay, so first we can use the sum law. That's the very first law. The limit of a sum is the sum of the limit. The limit of a sum is the sum of the limit. So that's the sum inside the square bracket. If the limit is x goes to three of the first, plus the limit is x goes to three of the second. And then we can use the uh, constant multiple law. The limit of a constant times a function is the constant times the limit. So we have the limit as x goes to three of f of x plus five times the limit as x goes to three of g of x. Okay, and now we're given, you know, the limit of x goes to three of g of x, and we're given the limit of x goes to three of f of x. So we're just going to substitute those. That's nine. 
and that's negative four. So uh, negative right. 20. Can I ask a question? Um, yeah. I missed a little bit, but um, you do the, the sum of the limit, right? So this one's equal to nine and this one's equal to negative four. How, how do you know um, the five goes on that side? Why does it start with five? Is that because? So here, that's using that constant multiple. Yeah, it was the sum, right? Oh, constant. So first, first, I did the sum. Okay. The limit of the sum of two things, and I split it up into the sum of two limits. Okay. And then I made use of the constant multiple law because I have the five times g. So see, you can pull the five out. Okay. That's why. And the limit is x goes to three. Of a function cubed, we can make use of that um, power law. Limit of a power is the power of the limit. And so we know what the limit of x is to d is. Negative four. So again, you can substitute in the negative four. You get negative sixty four. This is the root law. The limit of a root is the root of the limit. Okay, not to red and green. <laughs> And the limit of x goes to three if f was nine. The limit of x goes to three if f was nine. Sorry. Huh. Too much talking for me this first week. Okay, the limit of x goes to three. <laughs> of all that. So first of all, that's a limit of a quotient. So I can use the quotient law. The limit of a quotient is the same as the quotient of the limits. So it's the limit of the top over the limit of the bottom. 
And then on the top, I can use the constant multiple law and pull out the constant. And then I can make use of the values. So I have four times nine over negative four. So that gives me negative nine. And then the last one, the limit is x goes to three of g over h. So again, that's the limit of a quotient. So the limit of the quotient is the same as the quotient of the limit. But, oh, wait a minute. We're told that the limit as x goes to 3 out of h equals 0. So you can't have zero on the bottom. So that does not exist. All right, here's a bigger example. Um, find the limit using the limit laws. The limit as t goes to negative two of t to the fourth minus two over two t squared minus three t plus nine. Okay, so this is a rational function, and we know that we could substitute, but this problem actually specifically asks to find it using the limit laws. So that is a quotient. So the limit of a quotient is the quotient of the limit. The limit as t goes to negative 2 of the top. I'm going to put that in parentheses over the bottom, the whole bottom. So I'm going to put it in parentheses. And now I can use those sum and difference laws, right? On the top, it's a difference. So it's the limit as t goes to negative 2 of the first minus the limit as t goes to negative 2 of the second. And then on the bottom, the limit as t goes to negative 2 of the first minus the limit as t goes to negative 2 of the second plus the limit as t goes to negative 2 of the third. And then, you know, you can use the power law on the top, the constant multiple law and the power law on the bottom, but you have to really do one at a time. And okay, I see a uh, question. Will exam questions directly come from WebAssign? Yeah, they'll, they'll come directly from WebAssign. Exactly like copied from your exact homework problem. So you won't get anything you know, that you haven't already seen in the homework on the exams. Okay, so on the top, back to the fourth. Okay, 
And on the bottom, I'll do the constant multiple rule first, law, whatever. Constant multiple, pull the three out. And then again on the bottom. So I'm going to take all the limits at one time. So here that's two times. The limit as t goes to negative two of t squared. Okay, and then we can actually take those limits. Because go back to the limit laws and you look at number eight, the limit of, you know, as X goes to A of X equals A. So up on the top, the limit of X goes to negative X of X is the T there. The T there. A T, so you can just replace the negative two in for T. You see what I'm saying? And then the limit of the constant is just that constant. All right, two is two, no matter what happens to T. You can go to any value and two is still two. That is uh, law number seven, if you have your, there, law number seven. So close. Yeah. All right, and on the left one is on the bottom, get two, tell me, this one. Substitute in the negative two. And then minus three times negative two. And then the constant stays a constant. And you can do that math get 14 over 23. Um, professor, what's the on the second line up there? I wish I could point, but um, what does it say at the end? Uh, no. Oh, nine. Okay, in the right, I just see it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Find the limit. So notice here, we cannot use the quotient law and split up the limit of the top over the limit of the bottom because you get zero on the bottom. If H goes to zero. Uh, how do we know not to do that? Uh, you just have to do like trial and error. I mean, you can kind of see that. If you took the limit of the top, over the limit of the bottom, the limit of H as H goes to zero is zero. Oh, okay. 
that's just making use of, again, that law number eight, where you just substitute in. I see. Okay. And is it Marin or Marin? Marin? Uh, yeah, it's Marin, like Marin County. Marin, like Marin County. I thought I thought I read that too. Right? <laughs> um, yes. So you can click the practice button in WebAssign and For keep most, practicing. Most problems, any problem that has red numbers in it, you can click. There's usually like a practice another button. Um, it doesn't work for a lot of them that have like graphs. But if it has red numbers, those are randomly generated and you can yeah. practice another. Exactly. And also, so in WebAffine, like you'll see, I have practice exam one. All of the exam questions come from that practice exam. <laughs> so I've even helped to narrow it down a bit more for you guys. Okay. How many questions are on the exam? I'll have to look when we we get there, but because I think almost all, if not all, the exams have twenty questions, but okay. there might be one that has like fifteen or ten questions. Well, that's doable. That's great. Okay. I feel like you told us uh, last class that how long are the exams? Like, how long do we get for them? That's about three hours. And is it like a we can do it on our own time or is it would have to be done during class time? Anytime that day. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. I know, right? It's, yeah. <laughs> Trying to give you guys, you know, the best deal. All right. So we can't use the quotient law here. Um, But yeah, what you can do is, you know, change the order, the negative three minus uh, plus H, you can rewrite that. And then actually boil that out. And then the nines cancel. And you can factor the H out. And cancel the H's. So now you can use the difference law. The limit of the difference is the difference of the limit. And you can use, you know, these are laws seven and eight again. So you get zero minus six. Okay, so I'm going to call that problem A on the limit. Here's another one. So for this problem, you know, again, you don't want to use the quotient law because you're going to get a zero on the bottom. So we're going to use a technique called rationalizing the numerator. Normally we've rationalized denominators before, right? 
But to rationalize the numerator, right, you have a square root there. So that's what gives you the irrational. And multiply the top and bottom by the conjugate of the top. So it's the same first thing and the same second thing, but the opposite sign. And that is a fraction that equals one. And so multiply that out. Right, the radical times the radical gives you one plus h. And then the outer and inner terms, right, if you foil the top, go away. And then you have minus one. So the ones cancel. Uh, and then the eights cancel also. Don't forget to keep writing the limit as h goes to zero. That's a common mistake. And now you've got just one over this root plus one. And now you can use the limit law. The limit of the top over the limit of the bottom. And then you have the limit of the first plus the limit of the second on the bottom. And the sum law. And then the limit of a root is the root of the limit. And then you can use the sum law inside there. So it's the limit of the first plus the limit of the second. That's an H. And now you can use laws seven and eight, direct substitution and, um, you know, the limit of the constant is just a constant. So you have in here a one plus a zero. And the square root of one is one, yes. Here's an absolute value there in the bottom. So remember the definition of absolute value. Absolute value of x, you know, it's positive if the thing inside is not negative. You know, like absolute value of 5 is 5. Absolute value of 0 is 0. 
or it's the opposite of what's inside if the thing is negative. Like the absolute value of negative three is positive. The opposite, right? So if you're not familiar with kind of, I'm sure you know that, like the absolute value of negative three is positive three. But if you're not familiar with writing the definition like that, I want you to make that link because you're going to be using this, you know. So the absolute value of x, that positive x if x is greater than or equal to zero, it's the opposite of x if x is negative. So, you know, when we're taking this limit, because of that absolute value, the absolute value of x plus 2 is x plus 2 if x plus 2 is greater than or equal to 0, which means x is greater than or equal to negative 2. I'm just solving for x there. And it's the opposite of x plus 2 if that thing is less than 0, which means x is less than negative 2. And why is this important? Because I have to split this limit up into two different things. We want the limit if x goes to negative 2. And now you have to be concerned about values of x, you know, from the right and values of x from the left of negative 2. So from the right, the limit as x goes to negative 2 from the right. We're going to use, you know, the positive x plus 2. And then cancel, uh, factor out the 5 on the top. And the x plus 2 cancel. And the limit of the constant is just the constant. And then for the left, sorry, I realize time is up. Now it's the same idea, but now you have to do the opposite on the bottom, right? You have to use that one because you're looking from the left. So factor out the five on the top. The x plus two is cancel. And since the right-hand limit is not the same as the left-hand limit, the limit does not exist. Wait, uh, excuse me, Professor, uh, where does a plus 10 go um, in the equation? Like uh, in one step, it's like the 5x plus 10, and then in the bottom one, it's not there anymore. Uh, what happened mathematically? 
I factored the five out. Oh, okay, okay. Understood. Thank you. Yeah, I know. One little thing. <laughs> it messes one up. Okay, you guys, sorry to keep you. And um, have a great weekend. If you guys want to stay with questions, please do. But that's the end of class. And I'll see you um, next week. There was really just one problem I didn't get to. So we can talk about it next time. Uh, professor? Let me see before. Yeah. One question for the rehearsal. Yeah. Basically, it's just uploading all your solutions or from your work uh, from the homeworks. That's basically it. Well, so the rehearsal, I just want to make sure you know how to upload, you know, a scan. Yes. So we can talk about it next week, but um, I mean, that that's really it. So, yeah, oh, okay. you can, you know, you, you can just take like a few pieces of paper, scan them in and practice uploading them. Oh, okay. Thank you. Does it need to be? Yeah, any you're specific, Professor. So say again. Does it need to be um anything in specific, like a certain homework? Would you like to see the whole thing or just you just want to see we get the concept of the scanning? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And I mean, I would I guess I would at least have two pages just to make sure you know how to do multiple pages, but you know, I just want to make sure you're comfortable uploading work, you know. Thank you. I um yeah. I had a quick uh concern a little conversation I wanted to have with you um sure. it's more of a personal um uh situation if I recording 